right, welcome everyone. Might make a start. We're here to, today to talk about retirement. Stop thinking, start planning as part of Apt Wealth's regular event series. So welcome to any existing Apt Wealth clients. You'll have heard a lot of today through your advisor and Apt over the years, but it doesn't hurt to refresh. Uh, and welcome to any new family and friends of the Apt community. I'm Andrew Dunbar. I'm a director of Apt Wealth Partners. I've been helping people plan and live their best retirement for 20 years, and I'm looking forward to spending the next hour or so with you. Retirement's a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about. It's given me a lot of uh, purpose and satisfaction over the years, and I'm keen to get your thoughts about retirement uh, and, and what you think about retirement as we go along. Just some quick housekeeping to start with, uh, you'll see there's a Q&A box in your Zoom menu there. And I encourage everyone just to put in questions they've got as we go along. Uh, we'll do our best to get to those throughout the webinar, uh, but we've also got some time at the end to address them. So, you know, tell me what you think about retirement. What does retirement mean to you? What questions have you got about retirement? Happy to try and help you answer those. We'll also send out a recording of this event afterwards. Uh, so you can view it back. Uh, and during this webinar, we're going to run a poll as well. Now, the poll is anonymous, so it'd be great if you could answer that poll. It'll give us some food for thought as, as we address that through the webinar. Just a quick disclaimer to start with. Uh, the information today is general in nature. It doesn't take into account your personal circumstances. So you should always seek personal advice. All right, well, we're here to talk about retirement uh, and retirement's a topic that we love to talk about at Apt Wealth Partners. We love planning for it and we love living it with our clients. And this is our favorite quote, at your end, you'll regret the things you didn't do instead of the things that you did. And so we find that retirement, it's a time that everyone looks forward to. But unfortunately, it's also a time that's not well planned for. Uh, and this means that many people don't end up living their ultimate retirement lifestyle when there was no reason for that. They had the means and resources uh, and that they, they should have done that. So really our role is to help people identify what they wanna get out of retirement, what's gonna make them happy, and then set a plan to try and achieve that. So our agenda for today, we're gonna to cover uh, the big question, which is how much you need to retire. Uh, also, what retirement looks like to you individually. Then we'll talk about a couple of important concepts around your investments and also your superannuation, which are really important in delivering that retirement lifestyle. Uh, and then we will also touch on uh, an often missed element of this retirement planning, which is the lifestyle and emotional transition into retirement, which is extremely important. Okay, this is a stat that I find fascinating, and that is one in five Australians think about retirement daily or often. Uh, now, I'm not retiring anytime uh, soon, but you know, for those that are, there's a lot, there's a lot to plan for. Um, there's a lot of change, a lot to think about. You know, there's some of the things that people are asking themselves and thinking about. No doubt you're, you're in that boat as well. And of course, the big question on everyone's mind is how much do I need to retire? So let's have a look at that. Uh, and, you know, I want, I want to ask all of you, so we're going to do a poll in a minute, but how much do you think the average couple would need to retire comfortably? Is it 300,000? Is it 500,000? Is it 750,000? Is it a million? Or is it more? So let's, let's run a quick poll. I'm keen to get the uh, opinions of those in the room. So I'll put that poll up on screen now, just give everyone 30 seconds or so to fill that in. Uh, and once we've done that, I'll put the results on screen and we can have a quick chat about it. As I say, it's anonymous, so really keen to get everyone's feedback if you can.
just another couple of seconds. Okay, excellent. All right, so I'll put those results up on the board. And you know, this is this is interesting. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer in this, but you can see a lot of our, our people on the call today have put uh, a million or more. Uh, and there's some some answers in the five hundred thousand dollar category, some in the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar category as well. So a range of responses, but generally at the high end. And that's interesting because let's have a look at what the official studies currently say. Okay, so the Association of Superannuation Funds and the Australian Bureau of Statistics do this study every quarter and they update the numbers on what it costs a single person and a couple to live comfortably in retirement. And the figure that they currently come up with for a couple is 690000 and for a single 595 thousand dollars so you know um is is that right well you know it, it's a very individual thing but i think you, you've got to ask yourself the question could you live comfortably with peace of mind for you know 30 plus years potentially uh on that amount and everyone's answer to that question will be different and the reason for that is that retirement looks different to everyone Okay, so working out your number depends on a whole range of different things. Do you want to completely retire and never work a day again? Or are you going to do some part-time work, some contract work, follow a passion that's going to bring in some income during retirement? Do you want to stay in the family home forever? Or are you looking to downsize and realise some money from that changeover? Your know, cars, some people like to have two cars, some like to have one, some like driving a Mercedes, some drive a Toyota Corolla. All these things make a difference. Travelling, what does that mean for you? Do you want to travel around Australia in the caravan, take the odd cruise, or do you want to travel across the world every year flying business class? Yeah, that's obviously going to have an impact. And then helping family. Do you want to help the kids out with their first homes? Do you want to help grandkids with education fees, et cetera? I even had a, a client uh, one day tell me that they wanted to be on the first commercial flights to Mars. So, yeah, it's a very individual thing and your number will depend on your goals and objectives for the future. So in that official study, this is the annual expenses that they have come up with. They do it firstly for a very basic, modest lifestyle. It's paying the bills and, and getting by essentially, uh, which for a single is 31,000 and a couple is 45,000. Coincidentally, that's roughly the amount that the age pension currently provides. So if that was if that was you, you know, really you don't need much extra money uh, and, and you can re rely on the age pension. Doesn't sound like a lifestyle that most would be aiming for. A comfortable lifestyle on their numbers. Now, what's a comfortable lifestyle in their eyes? Well, it's having a good car, good clothes, electronic equipment, eating out, doing regular domestic travel, occasional overseas travel. Uh, and the number that they've come up with for that is just under 50,000 for a single and just under 70,000 for a couple. Now, whether that's right for you or not will depend. Uh, and you know, we've got clients whose number is 80, 90, 100,000, 150,000. It's a very individual thing, depending on what your priorities are. But really coming up with your number is the most important first step. So spending time to work out what you want to do in retirement, what it's going to cost, that will determine how much you need and how you're going to set yourself up to best achieve that. So at, at Apt Wealth, we see two types of clients in retirement and I've tried to demonstrate this on this graph here. The first is represented by the blue. So a person retires with a certain amount of money in superannuation or in, in the bank and they invest that money through their uh, retirement. Now that, that investment will go up and down depending on the set of investments that they own over time. But what it will do is produce an amount of earnings or an amount of income every single year. And for these people, that amount of income is enough for them to do all the things that they want to do. 
So if you think back to that comfortable lifestyle of about $70,000 a year, in the blue here, this person, that would be their desired lifestyle and they'd be generating $70,000 of earnings or income a year from their investments. And what that really means is they're not needing to touch their investments. They're just living off the earnings uh, and that balance stays there for, for the majority of their retirement life. And the conversations when those people come in for their regular catch-ups with us, you can tell that money's not playing on their mind at all. It's very much them telling, about, telling us about their last trips, telling us about what the kids and the family are up to. They're not worried about the money, the earnings, the balance. Uh, you can tell they're not losing sleep over it. And that's, that's a great uh, mindset to live your retirement in and gives you the best chance of having no regrets and living that lifestyle with peace of mind that you want. The second type of client is represented by the red and they may either start with less money or they may, may just need to spend more money than that first client. And the, the investments that they have are not producing that amount of earnings. So every year they need to dip into their own capital a little bit um, to top up those earnings and live the lifestyle they want. So what happens with their money over time is that it slowly runs down. And that's fine. That's actually what the system's designed to do. You, you're supposed to work all of your life and build up your superannuation and then retire and live off it and spend it down and in, enjoy it. Spend the kid's inheritance, as they say. Uh, but the reality is when those people come in and catch up with us at their regular meeting, the conversations are much more like, or do you think we could afford to take a trip next year? Our kids are going through this time at the moment. Do you think we could provide them some assistance? What are our investments worth? How much income are we earning? You can tell that money is playing a lot more on their mind and that they're not as free to live that lifestyle that they desire. So where we can, the aim is absolutely let's try and get, get into that number one mindset uh, and have peace of mind to live the lifestyle that we want. And so to do that, our role working with people, yes, there is an important checklist of items that we need to go through. Um, we need to maximise superannuation and we're going to spend some time talking about that. We want tax effective strategies. We want more money in our pocket, not in the government's pocket. We want to access government benefits and maximise those. We need to be able to survive market downturns because they are going to happen and we'll talk about that. And we need to make sure that that income lasts a lifetime. But we need to do all of that to deliver peace of mind so that you can live the lifestyle that you desire. And that's really what it's all about. Um, you can't put a price on that peace of mind. Uh, and it's only when you achieve that that you will be able to live the lifestyle that you desire. So coming up with your number, very important first step. Next question is, where are you going to get that number from? Where's that income going to come from? And here are those options. We've got the government age pension, uh, as I said, which will cover poss possibly a very basic lifestyle. We've got superannuation, which we're gonna talk about. We've got potentially some savings and maybe some other investments. Okay, so they're, they're really our, our options. And what's the best mix of those to deliver deliver what we're after um, depends on everyone's individual circumstances, but we'll spend some time working through this. So let's, let's start by having a look at investments. And when we're talking about peace of mind, one of the big keys is to be able to understand your investments to deliver that peace of mind. Now, market downturns are a reality. If you want to seek long-term higher returns, then you need to be prepared for that volatility and the ups and downs of those investments. It's nothing to be afraid of, and we need to make sure that that can happen throughout our retirement uh, and not, not impact on us doing the things that we want to do. So I want to, I want to talk you through this graph. And this graph just demonstrates that market downturns can and will happen every year, uh, actually. So 
the grey bars are the annual return from the share market each year from the start of the year to the end of the year. So if you take 2012, 2013, which is sort of near the middle there, it's an easy one because they're both the same figure. So in 2012, in the grey bar, the annual return from the 1st of January to the 31st of December was 15%. And that was the same in 2013. So strong, strong uh, return on investment. However, during both of those years, at a point during the year, those red dots represent the largest decline in the share market during that year. So in 2012, at a point during the year, the share market declined by 10%. In 2013, the share market declined by 11%. But overall, it recovered. It finished the year in positive territory. And so as that line says there, the average drop per year over time has actually been 14%, but the returns have been positive in 22 out of 30 years. So for, for a higher long-term return, we need to be prepared and set up to be able to handle those short-term downturns. So how do we do that? This is... this graph summarizes the two different ways that people will generally have their superannuation and investments set up. So we'll start with the middle, the pie chart, which is how uh, a lot of Australians have their superannuation invested, where they have each little, each little piece of that pie represents a different investment class. So they might have some Australian shares, some international shares, some property, some cash, some fixed interest, etc. But it's all tied up in that one fund. They don't actually see all of their individual investments and they certainly can't control all of those individual investments. As opposed to outside of that, the set of investments where you can see things like Commonwealth Bank and CSL, Google, Microsoft, etc. Okay, You can see it, you can understand what you own, you can touch it and feel it. So there's two real benefits to this. One is the whole peace of mind thing. In the global financial crisis, as an example, the Commonwealth Bank share price went from something like $64 down to $27 at the bottom. But people who held Commonwealth Bank shares knew that it was Commonwealth Bank. It was going to be here in five years' time. It was going to be here in 10 years' time. It kept paying a dividend. You know, they... they it wasn't nice to see the value of their shares worth less, but it didn't cause them to panic about it. Whereas people who had that centre investment set up, like the pie chart, their, the value of their investments might have dropped 30, 40, 50% at that time, but they had no idea what those investments were, uh, what was happening, and it caused a lot of panic uh, it caused people to sell their, sell their investments and go to cash, which was completely the wrong thing to do at the time. Uh, you know, all sorts of bad decisions um, were made. And, and more importantly, they didn't have peace of mind to continue living their, living their life. So that's number one. And number two is the financial, the real financial outcome of this. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking through this and I've got a case study. So... When you retire, things change because you're now drawing down on your investments as opposed to contributing and building up your investments. And if you have that pie chart set up where everything's just lumped into one, what you're doing when you're drawing down on your money each month to get your income to pay for all of your expenses is you're actually selling a little bit of every piece of that pie. You're not getting a choice as to where that's coming from. And you just own a certain amount of units in that fund. And each month you're selling some of your units. Okay. And we're going to look at um, what impact that can have when the value of those units decreases. As opposed to around the outside, where you've got very similar investments, actually. You've got international shares, Australian shares, property, cash, fixed interest. But you've got control of those. You own them directly. They are all paying income into a cash account and from that separate cash account is where you're taking your regular monthly expenses. Let's have a look at what the impact of that is. So we modelled out 
the global financial crisis mark two, where the share market dropped by half and then took five years to recover back to its original level. And we took an example of Max and Jane, who both had a million dollars in superannuation and they were drawing $6,000 a month for living expenses, which they spent in full. Now that's reasonably high drawings, right? That, that's $72,000 a year on a million dollars, which is reasonably high. Um, but you know, it's, it's not an unusual set of circumstances. So firstly, Max, when, when the share market halved, Max now needed to sell double his units because they were worth half the amount. So to get his $6,000 a month, he had to sell double the amount of units every one of those months to get his $6,000. And as the share market recovered, he had so many less units because he'd had to sell them all down that his money only ever recovered to $375,000. Whereas Jane, on the other hand, very similar investments again, but this time she's got control of them. She's got them, they're her own separate investments and she's directing all of the income into a cash account where she's drawing her $6,000 from. It means she doesn't need to touch any of those investments. She can leave them there. They can recover back in value. And by the end of that six year period, Jane is back to 838,000. Of course, she spent 72,000 multiplied by six years. Um, and she's $463,000 better off than Max. So a very simple structural setup has a profound difference on, on the overall outcome. Okay, so that's one of the really important things that we see that impacts people through retirement. It's where we've seen people both fail and uh, be able to prosper. Again, as we go along, if you've got any questions, any thoughts, please put them in the Q&A box um, and we can get to those as we go or uh, at the end. The next thing I want to talk about is superannuation, which is the last free lunch in Australia, really. Why is superannuation such a good investment? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, one is while you're working and contributing to your superannuation, you are reducing your personal income tax. We'll have a look at that. Uh, number two, superannuation has very tax effective earnings. It's forced savings for retirement as well. So, you know, sometimes when we're speaking to a, a 30 year old or a 40 year old, they're saying, well, why should I put money in superannuation? I can't access it for so long. You know, I don't really care about superannuation. But I think we need to have the opposite uh, attitude because by saving for retirement and knowing that tomorrow is looked after, it gives you the peace of mind to be able to live for today and do all the things with your family that, that you want to do. So superannuation is not so much about just a tool for tomorrow. In, in my eyes, it's actually an enabler for lifestyle today. Uh, super is a very tax effective estate planning tool. We'll have a look at that. Uh, and it also provides tax-free income from retirement. So getting money into superannuation, there are essentially two different ways to put money into superannuation. One is called concessional contributions. One is called non-concessional contributions. Concessional contributions are just those that go in before tax or that you would claim a tax deduction for. So that's um, things like your employer contributions, salary sacrifice, or other tax deductible contributions. And there's a limit per year this year of $30,000 that you can put in. Non-concessional is then after tax contributions, money that you've got in the bank account, et cetera, that you just wanna put into superannuation. And you can do a lot more of that. So you can put in $120,000 this year, uh, each year, or you are also able to bring forward three years into one. And that means you could contribute $360,000 this year, but then you wouldn't be allowed to contribute any more non-concessional contributions for the next two years. So that's quite powerful to be able to get some money into superannuation into a tax-free environment as you're getting towards retirement. 
There's a tax benefit of contributing to super. Uh, this is this is the the real figures based on different levels of income. Uh, so let's take a person who say is on a hundred thousand dollars a year, for example. They're going to be in that middle tax bracket there, forty five thousand to one hundred thirty five thousand. If they were to take a dollar of income uh, as salary into their bank account, they would pay thirty two percent, including Medicare levy. If they contributed that money to their superannuation as a concessional contribution, salary sacrifice, etc., they would pay fifteen percent. So that'd be a saving of 17 cents in that dollar, which is effectively going into their pocket in superannuation. And you can see as the income gets higher, the tax benefit gets more until you get to 250,000. And that's where the government imposes an extra 15% tax on your contributions um, to, to um, make that system fairer. Now, the two phases of superannuation often get quite confusing uh, for people, understandably. So there's accumulation and pension mode. Accumulation is where you're contributing and your superannuation is building up, okay, before retirement. And in accumulation mode, you pay 15% tax on the earnings of the fund, okay? It's all done within the fund. None of this comes through to your personal tax re return. Um, but that's still a very attractive rate. If you were paying that yourself, that would be at your own marginal tax rate, which is likely much higher. So that's a real advantage. However, then when you meet what's called a condition of release, which is either uh, reaching age 60 and being fully retired or uh, being age 65, full stop, as example, you then start drawing down on your superannuation uh, by commencing what they call an account-based pension. And that's when your earnings become completely tax-free. Everything you earn, tax-free. Everything you take out, completely tax-free. So you know, that's why we say it's the last free lunch, really, in Australia. Very effective. Now, to compensate for that, on the right-hand side there, the government makes you take a minimum amount out of your superannuation each year because they don't want people building up endless amounts of money in a tax-free environment. And you can see there, uh, until you're age 65, you have to take out 4% and then uh, the, the percentage goes up after that. Now, some of the other little known or... Um, uh, strategies that people don't know about um, but are very effective if, if you can employ them. One is called the catch-up concessional contribution strategy. And what the government decided a few years ago was that they wanted people to be able to put money into superannuation as they approached retirement, and particularly those with balances under 500000 So they allowed people that hadn't made contributions in the years leading up to be able to catch up on those contributions and do them all in a year or two as they got to retirement. And this can be very effective. Uh, I won't spend too long on it, but very quickly, if you go back to the start of that graph there, financial year 20, the cap in that year was 25,000. That was the amount of concessional contributions you could put in. If you had put in 15,000, that meant you had unused cap space of $10,000. And so the government said, all right, well, we'll let you carry forward that $10,000 to the next year and you can contribute it and get the tax benefit in that year if you want to. So then in financial year 21, you had your normal limit of 25,000 plus you had the $10,000 from the previous year. So this year you could make $35,000 contribution if you wanted to. The next year, uh, it would carry forward again. So you could make $62,500 contribution uh, if you wanted to. And you carry that forward in this example. In, in the final year there, uh, you have $107,500 that you could put into super as a tax deduction if you wanted to. So if you had an investment property or you earned a high taxable income in that last year of before retirement and you wanted to get that money into superannuation and significantly reduce your tax in that year. This is a fantastic way that you can do that. Other little opportunities that we try to take advantage of, 
there's the government co-contribution where if you put if you earn less than sixty thousand four hundred dollars and you put up to a thousand dollars in your superannuation the government will match that up to 50 percent five hundred dollars so that can be quite useful uh, and the spouse tax offset as well if you have a low income earning spouse or a, a, a non-income earning spouse you can contribute up to $3,000 for them, and that will give you a tax offset of up to $540, sorry. So, you know, they're, they're only little benefits, but if you do them over a number of years leading up to retirement, this is thousands of dollars for nothing, basically, that you can have in extra superannuation money. One of the uh, most used initiatives over the last few years has been the downsizer contribution rules and we've had dozens and dozens of clients utilize this so subject to a set of parameters if you're over 55 and you sell your house you can contribute three hundred thousand dollars to superannuation and it won't count towards the, the cap so no matter what your balance is you can do it and importantly each member of a, of a couple can do it so if you are a couple and you downsized your home after reaching age 55, in theory, you could each put 300,000 into superannuation. You could also each do your maximum three year non-concessional contribution of, of $360,000. So in total, you could in theory put 1.32 million into your superannuation accounts. Uh, as, as you get to retirement. So it's been quite effective and allowed people to get money into a tax-free environment. Now we mentioned superannuation is an effective estate planning tool. And it is, but it's important that you are aware of the pitfalls uh, and that you plan for it. Now, the first thing is what's known as a binding death benefit nomination. It's critically important because superannuation is not automatically an estate asset. It doesn't flow through via your will automatically. So people will say, well, I've updated my will. My will says that if we pass away, everything goes equally to our kids, for example. So, you know, so happy days. But unfortunately, that's not actually the case. Um, if you don't have binding death benefit nomination on your superannuation fund, which is legally binding, instruction to the trustee to pay your superannuation where you want it to go, then in the end, it's really up to the trustee where to pay that money to. And your beneficiaries will have to try and fight with the superannuation fund to justify why they should be paid that money. So really important to put that in place. Uh, if you nominate your beneficiaries directly, for example, you know, your adult children or your spouse, you nominate them directly, then the super fund has to pay it there and it won't be part of your estate. Now, in Australia, we don't have death taxes, right? Well, by stealth, we do. Uh, and it's a, a little known fact that superannuation benefits, if inherited by non-dependents, so adult children is commonly uh, the scenario here, it attracts tax of up to 17%. So for example, a million dollars passes to your adult children, there can be tax up to $170,000. So it's a fair whack. Now, something called a re-contribution strategy is something we do with hundreds of clients in the lead up to and post retirement to try and eliminate as much of that tax as we possibly can. Let's look at a quick example of how that works. So here we've got Tom and Jane. They're age 63 and they've just retired. Jane has $720,000 in her account-based pension, which is all contributed by her employer uh, as a super guarantee contribution. Tom has no superannuation at all. Once Jane and Tom pass, they want that money to go to their adult children. They've nominated them as their uh, death benefit nomination. And those children would pay 17% on the funds received. So on that balance, they would pay tax of 122,400. So what can we do about that? Well, when Jane retired, she's met a condition of release, meaning she can now withdraw all of her superannuation 
tax-free, no consequences. So we withdraw her balance and we put it in the bank account for a day. Then, because Jane and Tom are under age 75, they're able to contribute 360,000 non-concessional contribution back into each of their superannuation funds. So we do that, we take the 720 out, we put it in the bank account for a day, we then put 360,000 in a superannuation account for each of Tom and Jane, all of that's done without any tax consequences and they then start taking their monthly incomes to live off in retirement. So there's really no impact on them, but what that's done is reduced that tax of $122,400 now to zero because that's tax-free money that's gone into their superannuation. Uh, and so that's changed it from tax paying to non-tax paying. So this is a very effective strategy uh, that, as I say, we've done this with hundreds of clients over the years. Just wanna spend a second talking about Division 296 tax. It's getting a lot of press at the moment. This is otherwise known as the $3 million superannuation cap. It doesn't impact on everyone. It's currently going through Parliament. We're waiting to see what will be approved and what the new rules will be from the 1st of July next year. Uh, basically, what, what it's designed to do is place an extra 15% tax on the earnings of a superannuation fund, uh, just on the balance that is above $3 million. Okay, but there's a whole lot of complexity to it uh, and they're talking about taxing unrealised gains. It's not going to be indexed, so it's going to affect more and more people as we go forward. So we just don't know where this is going to lie. Importantly for the moment, there's no need to take any action before June next year uh, and likely not a need to take any action before June the following year, 2026. Um, but we are doing a lot of work behind the scenes on the strategies and structures that will be employed uh, if and when that comes into play. Again, if you've got any questions as we go along, please put them in the Q&A box uh, and we can address those. So that's, that's the numbers side, investments, superannuation, all really important to deliver that lifestyle that you want to achieve. But what's often missed is the emotional and lifestyle transition to retirement. Uh, and it takes just as much, if not more, planning than the financial side. You can't spend 365 days a year playing golf. Uh, what are you going to fill your time with? What are the things that you want to achieve in your retirement? And what's going to make you happy? And these are the questions that we've tried to help thousands of people uh, over, over the years with. So, you know, we, we encourage you to raise this with us and we've got a whole lot of tools and resources to help you work through this. So the emotional transition, we see a lot of people struggle with this, particularly in the first six to 12 months of retirement. It's a big change. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, mental health issues, a lot of relationship problems and so forth from, from this transition. You do lose a lot of things when you exit the workforce. Uh, obviously, you lose the social connection and despite people's best efforts, staying in touch with work colleagues and so forth, uh, often doesn't happen and it's not the same. So you know, you've got to think about how you're going to replace that. Uh, we are social beings. The sense of accomplishment, the sense of purpose and direction. You know, how, are you, how are you going to have that sense of purpose in an unstructured day going forward? Uh, and the time, routine, structure of the workplace, that is a huge change to go then to an unstructured day uh, in retirement. So, you know, it takes a lot of thinking about how you're going to fill those days and, and what you want to do with yourself. Uh, I think for people who are working, you know, it, it sounds all, all roses and glorious, but actually it, it's a very hard thing to adjust to. Um, so as I said, we've got a whole range of tools and resources that, that can help you unpack this. And, you know, I, I love this. I think it, this is really so interesting. There's an Australian palliative care nurse, Bronnie Ware. Many of you might have seen this book, Top Five Regrets of Dying, where she uh, interviewed those who were in palliative care under her care uh, over a series of years and came up with the top five regrets of those people. 
So they were, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish that I let myself be happier and I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. So, you know, there's nothing there about I uh, wish I had more, more money or so forth. Um, it's really around happiness. And I think that that point there, life's a choice. It's your life. Choose happiness. It really does take proactive thinking to make sure that this happened. Otherwise, the days can get away. You can be preoccupied and worried about money. You know, how can you deliver that peace of mind to live a life that will deliver you your happiness? So, yeah, you, you've got options um, in retirement. You can go it alone um, or you can have someone to partner with you and help you through these issues. Uh, and really, it's all about achieving that peace of mind. And, and at Wealth Partners, we've look, we look after over 3,000 families and help them manage over $3 billion of funds. Uh, we have staff of over 85 with a dedicated investment team, dedicated specialist teams around those services like aged care and life insurance and so on. So the, your advisor's job is to get to know you, what's, what makes you happy, what do you value, what do you want to achieve in your life, and then call on all of those expert resources to help you achieve that. Uh, and, you know, it, it's hard to put a price on um, peace of mind, but hopefully that's what we're helping our clients achieve. So this is really, you know, a checklist, if you like, of how we work with clients through retirement, through retirement, the things that are really important. So living the lifestyle that you desire, and that starts with working out what that looks like. So what, what's important to you about money? What do you want for you and your family? Where do you want to live? How do you want to live? What do you want to achieve? Um, what's going to give you peace of mind? And then we set about setting you up to achieve that by you understanding your investments by maximising the amount of income that you receive from those investments, maximising any government benefits that you're entitled to, surviving the market downturns that we know are going to happen, um, not just occasionally, but you know every year really, and then helping you make not just the financial transition, but also that emotional and lifestyle transition as well. So hopefully that's been uh, useful to everyone. I can see a number of questions coming through uh, and I'd love to spend a few minutes trying to answer some of those. So let's have a look at this. Uh, I've got a question here. Do I need a self-managed super fund to hold my own investments? That's a great question. Uh, so the answer is no, that you don't. It is one of the structures you could have, and we do have clients with a self-managed super fund to hold their own investments. But in fact, now a lot of regular uh, regulated superannuation funds will let you hold your own investments in there, and they will just do all of the administration work, the tax return work, so that you get one annual statement like you would from uh, from the superannuation fund. So it's quite flexible these days, but. A self-managed super fund can still be appropriate for you depending on your objectives. Uh, on non-dependent tax at your death, if you leave your super to your estate, does your estate pay tax on it? That's another great question. So that depends on who the beneficiaries are in your estate. Uh, and that's why making the binding death benefit nomination directly to your um to your beneficiaries can be advantageous because you could direct it to the ones that wouldn't pay tax and you could have the rest of your estate directed to those that might have paid tax on super but wouldn't on other assets. So it takes a lot of thinking with your advisor and your solicitor. Uh, let's have a look for another question. Can you explain how recontribution for a single with a super balance of over 700,000? Yeah, great question. So. As I said, it's about eliminating as much of that tax as possible. We may not be able to eliminate it all. But what we what we could do, if you had 700000 as an example, we know we can make $360,000 contribution in one year, and that will mean 
we've used up three years worth of contributions. So if we do that now, today on the 10th of October, 2024, we're in the 24, 25 financial year. We won't be able to contribute then for 25, 26 or 26, 27. But when we get to the 1st of July, 2027, we would be able to do that again. So if you had 700,000 today, we could take 360 out, put it back into an account. And in what's that, you know, two and a half, three years time, we could do that again. And we would have eliminated that tax half in the first lot and then half in the second lot. Uh, can I contribute 300,000 as a downsizer if my super balance is over 1.9 million? So yes, you can. It doesn't, it doesn't count towards your total super balance cap. Um, so ordinarily you wouldn't be able to make a non-concessional contribution to super, but for the downsizer contribution, you can. Uh, if, if a recontribution strategy hasn't been mentioned to me, why might that be the case? It doesn't apply to everyone. And sometimes some people will already have eliminated that tax by other means over time. So um, I, I invite you to raise that with your superannuation fund, raise that with your uh, advisor. If you have an advisor, if you're with Apt Wealth, uh, you no doubt have that conversation with your advisor. Uh, if you are drawing a superannuation pension and also earning an income from shares, if you pay money into super, will you be able to get the co-contribution from the government? Uh, so a whole lot of complex rules that we don't really have time to cover today, but you need to be working to get the co-contribution in some format. Okay, it can be, it can be a tiny amount of income. Um, that's fine, but you need to meet what they call the work test. And if you do that, then they will take into account your work income plus your other income. So income on shares and so forth. As long as you were still then below the limit, yes, you could get the co-contribution. Uh, a couple of questions on, you know, defining, accessing the downsizer contribution. It does have a list of really complex rules around it, such as you have to have owned the home for 10 years and how long it's got to have been your, your principal place of residence and so forth. So we don't really have time to cover all of that today, but you know, I invite you to, again, speak to your superannuation fund or if you're an app client and speak, speak to your app advisor, they'll be all over it for you. Any other questions? Uh, binding death benefit nomination, what's the best way to check that this has been covered off? Uh, how might it work if people have a self-managed superannuation fund? Okay, good question. So you can check with your superannuation fund. Uh, if, if you have an advisor, check with your advisor, they'll be all over it. Uh, and a self-managed fund works the same. You still need to nominate a binding death benefit nomination, and there'll be a template form that's provided along with your trust deed, which your solicitor or your advisor can help you sort. Any other questions? Uh, I have money held in super in categories like property and international shares, but I don't have individual shares. Is it possible to invest in individual shares within a superannuation. Yes, it absolutely is. Uh, as I said, most superannuation funds now, uh, well, many anyway, will give you the option of being able to choose your own investments and own your own set of shares or, or investments. So you can do that via a self-managed super fund or via many standard regulated funds. Again, you know, if you've got an advisor, you can speak to your advisor about that. How does one choose between starting an account-based pension versus taking lump sum payments as income is needed, uh, which could also help minimise the impact of market downturns? Yeah, so going back to that, that page that I had where we compared accumulation phase with account-based pension phase, Remember that there is tax paid on earnings if you keep it in accumulation phase 
and just take out lump sums. So invariably, when you retire, you're better off to start an account-based pension, nominate even the minimum amount to take out, uh, and that will mean at least then you're earning tax-free income. You can always take additional lump sums from that account-based pension if you need to. Uh, great question here about what's the rough rule of thumb these days for an after-tax return on superannuation, assuming a, a modest risk profile. Well, uh, you've, you've made the exact right point there. It does, does depend on your risk profile, what's your appetite to risk. Obviously, if you've got zero appetite for risk and you just want your money in cash and term deposits only, well, you're going to be limited to what interest rates are at the time. And by the time you take into account inflation and the cost of living going up, you know, it's, it's going to be not much at all. But I think you know, safe safe to assume over a long period of time, somewhere between six and ten percent, again depending on that risk appetite and the mix of assets, is a reasonable rate to expect. I would always be more conservative as advisors. We're always more start on the more conservative side, uh, and hopefully that's a way that you can have then peace of mind that everything's going to be okay going forward. Um, some lovely feedback from people about the Up12 team. Thank you for that. Looks like that might be all the questions we've got for today. If there's any more questions that, that come through, uh, as, you, as many of you know, you, you'll be subscribed to our newsletter where we, we constantly take from advisors the questions they're getting from clients. Things like, you know, how, how's the best way to lend my money kids or give, give money to my kids for house purchases, um, strategies that we've talked about today, like downsizer contributions, how to set up my super, all of these kinds of things. So we, we produce um, content for you with our advice on those issues. So please send through those questions to us. I'll take another look at this after today and add those to the list to get back to everyone. We'll send out a recording of today's event. If you've got any feedback, we'd be grateful to receive it. Hope that's been useful for everyone. And we look forward to hosting you at the next App Wealth event. Thanks, everyone.